Moscow's Cookbook and Speakeasy with Chef Justice Putnam. Netroomsradio.com Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des TR, des photos de bord de mer, de mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère, de mon jardin d'hiver. One of the most distressing elements of these anguishing past 41 days since the horrific events of October 7th and the start of the brutal and bloody war between Israel and Hamas is the marked rise in anti-Semitic incidents around the world and right here in the U.S. The Anti-Defamation League's Center on Extremism documented 832 anti-Semitic incidents of assault, vandalism, and harassment in the U.S. in just four weeks following the attack. It comes out to an average of nearly 28 incidents per day and represents a 316% increase over the same period last year. You could just see it, I mean, in any city you live. Just here in New York City, anti-Semitic hate crimes surged 214% in the month of October. Across the country, we've seen synagogues and Jewish schools, Jewish centers, even a Jewish cemetery defaced, vandalized. People have torn down flyers, bringing attention to the more than 220 hostages kidnapped by Hamas on October 7th. A lot of these incidents have taken place under cover of night or behind the relative anonymity of a screen. But yesterday, the wealthiest man in the world made one of the most shocking public pronouncements of anti-Semitism I've seen. And he did it on the platform that he owns. I'm speaking, of course, of Elon Musk, the founder of SpaceX and Tesla, who purchased Twitter last year, changed his name, and promptly managed to lose $25 billion on it. Musk brought his hard right views to the platform where he elevated the most loathsome offensive bigots. He welcomed back outright and avowed neo-Nazis who'd been banned from the website. He's defended white supremacists, complained about racism against white people. He compared Jewish billionaire George Soros to a Jewish Marvel supervillain. With Elon Musk's attention and encouragement, those with the most despicable views have essentially taken over the platform now known as X. This is a man with enormous power and influence well beyond the internet. He's one of the most powerful private citizens in the world. Just yesterday, Musk attended a cocktail hour with Chinese President Xi Jinping that followed the bilateral meeting with President Joe Biden. Musk also has the ear of top U.S. officials who welcome him like royalty anytime he descends on Washington. And so it's this man who took to his website yesterday to endorse the most violent, dangerous anti-Semitic conspiracy theory. Now, it all began with a person who describes himself as a Jewish conservative expressing his anger about that recent rise of anti-Semitism. He addresses the, quote, cowards hiding behind the anonymity of the Internet and posting Hitler was right and calls for them to step out of the shadows and, quote, say it to our faces. And that prompted a reply from another user who wrote, okay, right? Responding, okay, say it to your faces. People think Hitler was right. Okay, I'll talk to you. Jewish communities have been pushing the exact kind of dialectical hatred against whites they claim to want people to stop using against them. You want truth said to your face. There it is. I wish I could say this was a fringe view, but is a viled and over-century-old 
anti-Semitic conspiracy theory. Basically, the Jewish people, in coordination with people of color, are a kind of conspiracy to assault whiteness. And in fact, that Jews are behind this conspiracy. This same conspiracy, which has sort of come to be known as the Great Replacement Theory, that Jews are, are the sort of puppet masters manipulating American immigration policy to replace white people, this has permeated into a, a large swath of the American right. We saw it in Charlottesville, most infamously in the 2017, where the marchers chanted, Jews will not replace us. It was this view that was the inspiration for the perpetrator of the horrific anti-Semitic mass murder at the Tree of Life Synagogue in 2018. The, the killer said so himself. So Elon Musk, the richest man in the world, one of the most powerful and influential men in the world, the owner of this platform, replied to the post espousing that vile theory, replied to this post that replied to someone calling out those who think Hitler is right and said, OK, he says this to the guy that said that theory. You have said the actual truth. The actual truth. Jews coordinating this assault on whiteness. So shocking and repellent that Elon Musk, a man of the highest echelons of our society, would not just say something like that, but actually believe it. <laughs> it's a reminder that anti-Semitism is dangerous and enduring even at the very highest levels of American society. A and we should be clear, there's a real history of this in this country. Many notable, powerful American figures through the ages were just rank anti-Semites. Probably the most notorious example is actually a man who's probably the closest historical analog to Elon Musk in many ways, Henry Ford. Of course, Ford was the founder of the Ford Motor Company, the perfecter of assembly line production, one of the wealthiest and most influential men of the earliest 20th century, one of the great industrialists of the world history. And he was also, as many people know, an anti-Semite. But the, the zealousness, the viciousness with which he pursued that cause of hating Jews, the cause of global persecution of Jewish people, that I think has been a bit underemphasized in our collective recollection. It, it's not an asterisk to Henry Ford's legacy, it's right at center. In fact, before the rise of Adolf Hitler, Henry Ford was probably the most powerful anti-Semite in the world. This is a topic of Rachel Maddow's remarkable new book, Prequel about fascist sympathizers in the United States around World War II and those who defeated them. And this past weekend, I, I got a chance to speak with Rachel for a live episode of my podcast, Why Is This Happening? And she read us an excerpt about Henry Ford's story. He was one of the most successful and celebrated industrialists on the planet. His anti-Semitism was rank and it was unchecked. He spewed it freely in private tirades among friends, family, close business cohorts, newspaper reporters, or pretty much anybody within earshot. Ford was hardly the only radical anti-Semite in the US circa 1920, but in addition to his fortune and his famous name and his iconic company, he had a megaphone your average crazy uncle theorizer lacked. He had Twitter. No, I'm kidding. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. It's X. I'm supposed to say X. Yeah. Sorry. He had a newspaper. It was called the Dearborn Independent. Every week for 92 weeks, headlines like these. The International Jew, the world's problem. And Jewish jazz, moron music, becomes our national music. And this one, the perils of baseball, too much Jew. These headlines were splashed onto the pages of Ford's paper, which was distributed in Ford dealerships across the country. Ford also saw to the publication of his series in book form. It was titled The International Jew. It ran to four volumes. The German edition of Ford's book had landed in the hands of one particularly gifted propagandist. When Adolf Hitler's book, Mein Kampf, was published in 1925, the author appeared to lift not just ideas, but whole passages from Ford's own publications. Mein Kampf's first edition extolled Ford by name. When a reporter from the Detroit News showed up at Nazi Party headquarters in Munich in December 1931 to interview Hitler, she had a series that was called Five Minutes with Men in Public Eye. And she had her five minutes with Hitler. When she went to Hitler's office, she was surprised to find hanging on the wall behind Hitler's desk 
a large framed portrait of a very famous American. Hitler explained to the newspaper woman, I regard Henry Ford as my inspiration. Wild, right? Didn't know it until I read the book. And that was just part of our wide ranging two hour conversation. If you want to hear more, you're in luck. The incredible With Pod episode will be streaming exclusively on Peacock starting this Friday, November 17th. Now, to be clear, Elon Musk is not at the Henry Ford level yet. There are real warning signs emanating from one of the world's most powerful men and from society at large. Anti-Semitism is on the rise. It's real. It's dangerous. In the case of Elon Musk, it is just staring us in the face. It is Friday, the 17th of November of 2023, and you are in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. I am your chef de cuisine, Justice Putnam. Gunner the English Bulldog is our snoozing sous chef. Precious the Little Yorkie is our door girl. And she will be seating you directly for our especially special daily special Blue Moon Spirits Fridays because we are all Nighthawks in the Diner of Life. Okay, you can put that in your hopper. And many people do. Oh, yes, they do. Okay. Well, we have a couple of uh, uh, stories about Elon Musk today. And uh, usually we don't double up on stories, but they they are somewhat d- different, but the same. So we're going to get into that a little bit later. Uh, the president of, or the former president of the United States. I guess you could call him now the president of the Confederate MAGA states has made his pronouncements on the world and he just never stops. You know, I wish when they impose a gag order, they put an actual gag in that guy's throat. Well, I don't, maybe just his mouth. Put it down his throat. That might be a little bit too final. Uh, I mean, he is he is due his day in court, and I wish we could get there <laughs> because this this uh, Eileen Cannon lady, you know, the judge down there, uh, I guess it's not even in the Mar-a-Lago district. How does that work? <laughs> I just don't know. And everybody goes, oh, well, we're just going to have to let him have Cannon. And they did. And she's part of his defense team. I don't know how else to explain it. Uh, let's remember she was stacked on the courts after he lost the uh, election and before January 6. Why was that? (laughs) Because he expected a judge to coronate him and that was the only one who would do it. Okay. So now they're, you know, they had to make up plan B because I actually think, you know, uh, he he really believed that he was going to be reinstalled. He still does. We need to dissuade him of that notion. And I'd like to put him in a little cell. You know, the regular size kind. Uh, for, yeah, say, fairness purposes. Mm-hmm. Good for the goose. And good for the gander kind of thing. So, uh... Now, no one's taken out full-page ads in the New York Times, uh, you know, advocating the death penalty in this case. Unlike what he did to some innocent kids. Who now, one of them, Yusuf, has uh, been elected uh, to government there in New York. (laughs) That'll teach you, Donnie. So, uh, so Eileen Cannon is going to incrementally delay probably the most important trial because this mother effer stole top secret documents from, from the United States government, hoarded them at his resort or whatever it is there. Um, and looks like he was, uh, selling them to worthy of the highest bidder, just whatever he could get at the time. You know, valuation on top secret documents is so hard. It's it's really how you feel about it. It is. They're only valuable if you feel like they you know might help you out of hostile foreign power. 
and that hostile foreign power is willing to pay. Set your value. He did it with his properties when he laundered Russian mob money, which he's still doing, by the way. (sighs) So when the governments, state and federal governments, take over his properties, do they take the mortgage payments from the mobsters? I don't know. Do the mobsters have mortgage payments? I just... I'm just thinking, how how does that work? Wouldn't wouldn't Russian mobsters in your condo association be kind of like a blem on the on the property title? I I would make it a blem, but that's just me. So everybody thinks this is normal. He thinks he can just value whatever his pro- whatever he thinks his property can handle. Yet anybody who has ever negotiated anything. <laughs> selling or buying a house knows that is just ludicrous on his face. My God. Unless I don't know that uh, we've always heard stories about that New York commercial real estate market. Jeez. I guess the residential market might be, I don't know, right up there. You never know. So maybe, maybe it is normal. I don't think so. I really don't. Anyway, uh, he seems to be dominating the (laughs) conversation once again because he's a fascist pig. There's no getting around it. I don't know. So maybe maybe uh, that's why old MAGA Mike says that the the United States, America is so depraved and irredeemable. No shit, Sherlock. Look at your fellows. You know, you ought to be, uh, you know, getting in, uh, getting everybody on a knee and saying, let's be better people. I always thought that Christian charity meant that you were charitable to others, less fortunate than you, rather than, I don't know, condemning them to hell and sending them there with that AR-15 that you've got, uh, you know, slung over your shoulder and you're, uh, I don't know, maybe... Maybe praying and getting on a knee in that religious cult means that you kill people with your gun while on a knee. You get a better base, you know, stronger, stronger. You don't get pushed over. It's like a, it's like a natural tripod. Hmm. Okay. Well, old Mega Mike, as we know, is a heretic, and that whole prosperity gospel BS. Is her is heretical uh, on a space as well, and they're uh, they're holding up a libertine <laughs> such as Donald Trump. What are they, I guess he is the Antichrist. If that's the case, I mean, every all the descriptions of the Antichrist fits this guy to a T. It does. I'm just telling you, <clears throat> just that. Thing on top of his head, whatever that is, is it a comb over? I, I, what, what kind of, of, uh, I was going to say tonsorial, but that's not the true term. But what, what, what kind of barbering is that? I, I, what do they call that? Jeez, is it a comb over? Might be. It seems sculpted. So that right there would give any, I don't know, God-fearing Christian the idea, you know what, (laughs) that guy is effing evil. What is that on his head? The bronzer he's using now, too, has gotten, he must have run out of the supply of it. I don't know. Maybe, where was he getting it? (laughs) I don't know. Could have been from one of his... uh, Doctors, Ronnie is in Texas. Maybe Ronnie knows where to get it. <sighs> I think it was a bronzer that had some sort of, I don't know, pick me up in it, too. He wore it so heavily. I, <laughs> people actually think that that is, I don't know, godlike. I, I don't know. Some people have low standards for what it means to. I don't know, be led. I thought this was America. 
Well, it is. Okay, well, there's so much more going on in the world, and we might as well get into these uh, articles that we curated for you today in this salon that we call West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Yes, uh, Ellen Musk's shocking pronouncement of anti-Semitism is not only repellent on its face, it's also abhorrent that he actually believes it. And he does. <laughs> Let's not quibble. IBM thinks so. I expect a few others to think so as well. Mm -hmm. Then on the rest of the menu, climate change in Texas science textbooks are causing divisions on the state's education board, and well, it should. The U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission urged a federal judge to force Elon Musk to testify for its investigation into his $44 billion takeover of Twitter. Where did he get that Saudi money from? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and a federal judge in Nevada has dealt another legal setback to Native American tribes trying to halt construction of one of the biggest lithium mines in the world that just happens to be on one of their sacred sites. Oh, too bad. Thanks. After the break, we move to the chef's table where Blackwater founder Eric Prince and four others went on trial in Austria over the export of illegally modified crop spraying planes for military purposes. And the U.S. will resume food aid to millions across Ethiopia after a months-long pause over massive corruption. All that and more on West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon Appetit. Radio.com off to the right of the page is the chat room link monitored by Kelly Lincoln. So thank you, Kelly, for doing so. Across the page to the left from that chat room link uh, near the bottom of our homepage at NetRootsRadio.com is the link to our Patreon site. And if you could become a recurring Patreon of NetRoots Radio, it really helps us pay our bills and continue this powerhouse of resistance as the founders originally intended so many years ago. So please do. Please become a recurring Patreon. Please. <laughs> If you would like to follow Netroots Radio on Twitter, Mastodon, Spoutable, Blue Sky, you know, you can do so at Netroots Radio. Tom takes care of those. Thank you, Tom. Follow me on all of those. And also, you know, you can follow me on Tumblr and Instagram and Facebook at Justice Putnam. I incidentally post the show notes and links diary. 10 minutes before showtime, so you're able to peruse at your leisure the actual articles which inspires this fabulous uh, little salon. <laughs> Is it little? And uh, the little speakeasy down in the back, too. Oh, yeah, past the chef's table, just so you know. And that's what inspires us, but you can read the actual articles, and you can do so by following those social media feeds because the links to my Daily Coast Diaries are right there. They are. You can follow the show on Twitter at Cookbook West. And please do pick up podcasts by way of Spreaker, TuneIn, iHeart, YouTube, iTunes, really wherever podcasts can be found. Can't find them on Stitcher, though. What's Stitcher? Yeah, what is it? All right. Got that out of the way. It's Friday. This first offering here in the Bistro Cafe, part of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, is out of the Associated Press by Acacia Coronado. 
how science textbooks in Texas addressed climate change is at the center of a key vote expected today after some Republican education officials criticized the books for being too negative toward fossil fuels in America's biggest oil and gas state. Yes, I suppose you have to have hagiographies for all of that. Oh, my. The issue of which textbooks to approve has led to new divisions on the Texas State Board of Education, which over the years has faced other heated curriculum battles surrounding how evolution and U.S. history is taught to more than 5 million students. Science standards adopted by the board's conservative majority in 2021 do not mention creationism as an alternative to evolution. Those standards also describe human factors as contributors to climate change. But some Republicans on the 15-member board this week waved off current textbook options as too negative toward fossil fuels and failing to include alternatives to evolution. Alternatives? One of Texas's regulators of the oil and gas industry, Republican Wayne Christian, <laughs> has urged the board to choose books that promote the importance of fossil fuels for energy promotion. Wow, that's nice. Science and history written for the corporate giants in your state. Now, Texas has more than 1,000 school districts, and none are obligated to use textbooks approved by the board. Still, the endorsements carry weight. Friday's vote today will decide whether the proposed textbooks meet the standards set in 2021. Branch said multiple books comply with the regulations sent set then by the board and follow the consensus of the scientific community. Now, scientists overwhelmingly agree that heat-trapping gases released from the combustion of fossil fuels are pushing up global temperatures, upending weather patterns, and endangering animal species. Aaron Kinsey, a Republican board member and executive of an oil field services company in West Texas, criticized photos in some textbooks as negatively portraying the oil and gas industry during a discussion of the materials this week. The selection of certain images can make things appear worse than they are, and I believe there was bias, Kinsey said, according to Hearst Newspapers. Now, in a letter on Thursday yesterday, the National Science Teaching Association, which is made up of 35,000 science educators around the United States, urged the board not to allow misguided objections to evolution and climate change impede the adoption of science textbooks in Texas. How many textbooks the board could reject Depends on the grade level and publisher, said Emily Witt, a spokeswoman for the Texas Freedom Network, a left-leaning watchdog of the board. She said their organization had identified only two textbooks that would not meet the standards set in 2021. Chris Prentice of Reuters brings us this next offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, Blue Moon Spirits Fridays. The U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission on Thursday yesterday urged a federal judge to force billionaire Elon Musk to testify for its investigation 
into his $44 billion takeover of social media giant Twitter that he insists people call X, but people insist they won't. In this reporter's opinion. In a document filed in federal court in San Francisco yesterday, the SEC defended its efforts to to compel Musk's testimony, saying agency officials are acting within their authority. The SEC last month said it was investigating Musk's 2022 purchases of stock in Twitter, which Musk subsequently renamed X, and no one will ever call it that except his blue check psychophants, in this reporter's opinion. And his statements in SEC filings related to his tech takeover of the social media giant. Musk had refused to attend a September interview for the probe, the SEC said. Musk and his lawyers on November 2nd asked the judge to deny the SEC's motion to compel his testimony, saying Musk had already testified twice and that the agency was exceeding its authority. But the SEC on Thursday yesterday rejected those claims, saying agency inf- officials are indeed granted authority by law to seek testimony and documents as they pursue their investigative work. The SEC has previously also noted that it has received new documents in the investigation since their last interview in the court battle is the latest flare-up in the acrimonious relationship between the U.S. market regulator and the world's richest person. This final offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. A federal judge in Nevada has dealt another legal setback to Native American tribes trying to halt construction of one of the biggest lithium mines in the world. U.S. District Judge Miranda Du granted the government's motion to dismiss their claims the mine is being built illegally near the sacred site of an 1865 massacre along the Nevada-Oregon line. But she said, in last week's order, the three tribes suing the BLM deserve another chance to amend their complaint to try to prove the agency failed to adequately consult with them as required by the National Historic Preservation Act. Given that the court has now twice agreed with the federal defendants and plaintiffs did not vary their argument, Court is skeptical that plaintiffs could successfully amend it, but skeptical does not mean futile, Du wrote on November 9th. She also noted part of their case is still pending on appeal in the Ninth Circuit of Appeals, which indicated last month it likely will hear oral arguments in February as construction continues at Lithium Nevada's mine at the Thacker Pass about 230 miles northeast of Reno. Du said in an earlier ruling, the tribes had failed to prove the project site is where more than two dozen of their ancestors were killed by the U.S. Calvary on September 12th of 1865. Her new ruling is the latest in a series that have turned back legal challenges to the mine on a variety of fronts, including environmentalists claim that it would violate the 1872 mining law 
and destroy key habitat for sage grouse, cutthroat trout, and pronghorn antelope. All have argued the Bureau violated numerous laws in a rush to approve the mine to help meet skyrocketing demand for lithium used in the manufacture of batteries for electric vehicles. All right. Well, we'll follow that as it develops, and let us now go to our break. And when we get back from that break, we will go through weather from around the world, and we will finish up with the stories that we have curated for you today. You are listening to West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, and we will be right back. You are listening to NetworksRadio.com. Please hang up and try again. From a point at sea to the circles of your mind, a new force is at work for planetary transformation. New radio for a new Earth. This is Take Two Movie Review. I'm Mike Friend. This week, The King's Other Half. On election night, Democrats in Mississippi came within a few points of winning the governorship. Did the fact that their candidate was Elvis Presley's cousin have anything to do with that? Can't say, but with last year's Bouse Lorman picture, and now a biopic about Elvis's wife, Priscilla, it's clear that the fascination with Elvis continues. Having said that, though, the Sofia Coppola adaptation of Priscilla Presley's memoir Elvis and Me, while in the universe, is very much Priscilla's story. Notable characters from other Presley sagas, like Colonel Parker are relegated on screen to an undifferentiated gaggle of hangers-on played by extras. The story picks up in the late 1950s while the king is fulfilling his military service in Germany and meets the then 14-year-old Priscilla. She's infatuated with him, as was about every 14-year-old girl at the time. However, here, arguably the most famous man in the world is infatuated with her, and the movie is mostly a nuanced and revealing narrative of the pair's relationship. Elvis skyrockets, Priscilla grows up. Elvis spirals, Priscilla gains agency, and eventually ends things. Relative newcomer Kaylee Spaney does wonderful work here, showing strength rather than victimhood in a relationship that, even granted some leeway for historical and cultural differences, seems abusive. In late 2022, Variety and other outlets made public some emails between Coppola and the late Lisa Marie Presley, indicating that she had some serious issues with the depictions of her parents in a script she reviewed. No word if that was the final script. Dan Priscilla herself is an executive producer here, but liberties are not. Not, Priscilla is a well-done film that seems thematically in line with much of Coppola's other work. This has been Take Two Movie Review. I'm Mike Friend. Catch up with us at TakeTwoMovieReview.com and feed us back on our channel on YouTube. This program is presented by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Welcome to A Cup of Health with CDC, a weekly feature of the MMWR, the Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report. I'm your host, Dr. Robert Gaines. Arthritis affects more than one in five adults and is the most common cause of disability in the United States. Dr. Camille Barber is a researcher with CDC's National Center for Chronic Disease Prevention and Health Promotion. He's joining us today to discuss ways to control arthritis. Welcome to the show, Camille. Thank you. Camille, are there different types of arthritis? Yes, there are over 100 types. The most common types are osteoarthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, gout, and fibromyalgia. What are the symptoms of arthritis? Arthritis, which is uh, joint inflammation, can result in pain, stiffness, and swelling in the joints. Does arthritis affect some people more than others? Yes, it affects uh, primarily the elderly. It also affects people with chronic conditions such as heart disease, diabetes, and obesity. And it's also much higher in women compared to men. What are some strategies for managing arthritis pain? 
Now, adults with arthritis may be reluctant to engage in physical activity because of the symptoms that they have, such as joint pain and stiffness. However, we know that there are low-impact types of physical activities, such as walking and swimming, that have been shown to uh, improve function and reduce pain in adults with arthritis. There are also self-management programs that, in addition to these physical activity programs, have different ways to maintain weight and other ways to control your arthritis symptoms. How can people reduce their risk of developing arthritis? So as I said earlier, osteoarthritis is the most common type of arthritis, and the best way to reduce your chances of developing it is to maintain a normal weight and avoid joint injury. Camille, where can listeners get more information about arthritis, including the self-management program? Listeners can go to cdc.gov slash arthritis. Thanks, Camille. I've been talking today with CDC's Dr. Camille Barber about ways to control the pain caused by arthritis. Remember, although there's no cure, arthritis can be controlled through medical treatment, regular exercise, and weight maintenance. If you suffer from arthritis, talk to a health care provider about programs to manage your condition. Until next time, be well. This is Dr. Robert Gaines for A Cup of Health with CDC. For the most accurate health information, visit www.cdc.gov or call 1-800-CDC-INFO. This program is presented by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Welcome to A Cup of Health with CDC, a weekly feature of the MMWR, the Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report. I'm your host, Dr. Kathleen Dooling. Occasional aches and pains are an expected part of life, but for many people, pain is a constant companion. Dr. Chad Helmick is with CDC's National Center for Chronic Disease Prevention and Health Promotion. He's joining us today to discuss ways to manage chronic pain. Welcome to the show, Chad. Thank you. Chad, how many people in the U.S. suffer from chronic pain? In 2016, 50 million adults had chronic pain, which is pain on most or every day in the past six months. More interesting, though, is that 20 million people have high-impact chronic pain, which is chronic pain that also limits their work or life activities on most or every day in the past six months. This is a problem because chronic pain is associated not only with symptoms, but with anxiety and depression, reduced quality of life, and the risk of opioid problems. What are the most common causes of chronic pain? The most common causes generally relate to bones and joints, like low back pain and arthritis, but there are many other causes, headaches, sickle cell disease, fibromyalgia, surgery and injuries, and many, many others. Is chronic pain more common in any particular group of people? Yes, it's, uh, it occurs at all ages, but it's more common in um, older middle-aged adults and in the oldest old, 85 and older. It's also more common in women, poor people, and those who live in rural areas. How is chronic pain treated? Well, the first thing to do is to get a diagnosis, which can help guide treatment. But the thinking about chronic pain now is it becomes a chronic disease by itself, regardless of the cause, and that can cause significant problems. The real goal in management is to have a manageable level of pain, not to get rid of all pain. There are several steps that can be taken, and these are sometimes difficult to do because of barriers to access. But it makes sense to do the simplest and safest things first. And these are non-drug steps, things like physical activity. Walking is perfectly good to help reduce pain. Also, self-management education can give you some confidence in managing chronic pain when you're on your own. There's also physical therapy, occupational therapy, psychological therapy, better sleep, which usually means less alcohol, and seeing a chiropractor or getting biofeedback and massage. If that's not enough, non-opioid drugs like Tylenol or Motrin and Advil or Naproxen or Aleve can help. If those don't work, then it's time to consider something stronger. Sometimes that's opioids, but there's not great evidence that opioids are good for long-term pain in most people. Do you have any advice for people suffering from chronic pain? Well, it's important to work with a variety of providers who are working together to help you. Uh, The goal, again, is manageable pain so you can live a productive life. This can include physical therapy, most people can walk, to treat any underlying depression or anxiety, and to avoid further injuries. Finally, the National Pain Strategy is laying out a strategic roadmap to improve pain management system in this country. Where can listeners get more information about managing chronic pain? 
Listeners can go to the NIH website, nih.gov, and type in National Pain Strategy. Thanks, Chad. I've been talking today with Dr. Chad Helmick about ways to manage chronic pain. If you're experiencing daily pain, talk with your healthcare provider to ensure you have the correct diagnosis and know how to manage your condition. Until next time, be well. This is Dr. Kathleen Dooling for A Cup of Health with CDC. For the most accurate health information, visit cdc.gov or call 1-800-CDC-INFO. Hi, I'm Tom Hartman, and since you're listening to NetRootsRadio.com, show your progressive side and go to the Donate button on the bottom of the homepage. It's progressives like you who power NetRoots Radio and keep the progressive message beaming everywhere 24 hours a day. Just go to our Donate button at the bottom of NetRootsRadio.com. Thank you for keeping progressive radio at full power. Bertie Bowman began his career doing janitorial jobs and sweeping the steps of the U.S. Capitol in 1944 when he was 13 years old. I'm Bill Newman, and this is the Civil Liberties Minute. Bowman had run away from his home in South Carolina, where his family worked as sharecroppers. He later said that when he was in the cotton fields, he'd look at airplanes and buses and wonder where they were going. Some 20-plus years later, in 1965, still in D.C., he joined the staff of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. As committee clerk, he supervised interns and messengers, including one Bill Clinton, who he bonded with over their shared love of Elvis Presley. President Clinton wrote the foreword to Mr. Bowman's 2008 memoir, Step by Step, A Memoir of Living the American Dream. And Joe Biden wrote the blurb on the cover. When Bowman retired after working for the committee for 56 years, he was the longest serving black staff member in Congress. One difficult part of his life story, as reported in the New York Times, some of the senators who helped him in his career were Southern segregationists. As he told NPR, I'd be telling you a lie if I said some things those senators said didn't hurt me. Bertie Bowman, a respected and beloved person in the Capitol, died in late October at the age of 92. Rest in peace, Bertie Bowman. The Civil Liberties Minute is made possible by the ACLU because freedom can't protect itself. You're listening to the American Democracy Minute, keeping your government by and for the people. Voters in three Michigan cities approved ranked choice voting November 7th, but state law doesn't yet allow it. November 15th, the Voter Choice Act was reintroduced in the U.S. Senate, proposing matching funds for state and local governments to implement RCV. Voters in Kalamazoo, Royal Oak, and East Lansing passed changes to their city charters to allow ranked choice voting for mayor and city commission. That's good news for democracy advocates who argue that RCV offers more options for voters, guarantees a majority winner, and costs less in the long run by eliminating expensive and low turnout runoff elections. Problem is, Michigan law doesn't allow RCV, though Michigan Live reports that a state representative plans to introduce a bill to allow it. Meanwhile, in Washington, U.S. Senators Michael Bennett of Colorado and Angus King of Maine reintroduced the Voter Choice Act, proposing $40 million in federal matching funds to help states and municipalities implement ranked choice voting systems. Maine and Alaska currently use it statewide. Nevada and Arizona will vote on it in 2024, and 50 counties and cities have adopted it, making it one of the fastest-growing democracy reforms. Passage of the Voter Choice Act is unlikely in the U.S. House because the Republican National Committee recently opposed RCV. We have more on ranked choice voting and the groups taking action at AmericanDemocracyMinute.org. I'm Brian Beal. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 1747. That was the day that a crowd of Boston workers took British officers as hostages and held them for three days. The workers were outraged that fellow Bostonians had been pressed into service on British Navy ships against their will. Impressing ship crews was one of the ways the British manned their ships when there were not enough willing crew members. The seaport at Boston 
Boston had become so notorious for this kind of worker kidnapping that other merchant vessels had begun to avoid the area for fear that their crews might be taken by the British Navy. Bostonians became increasingly vocal against the practice and worried about its impact on the local economy. In 1745, the local selectmen petitioned for, quote, immediate relief from impressment. They wrote that it was a matter that, quote, nearly affects the liberties of the people and is a great insult upon this government. Two years later, Commodore Charles Knowles sailed into Boston on his way to the West Indies. While he resupplied and refit his ships, some of his crew members escaped from service. To make up his diminished crew, on November 16th, Knoll ordered local workers to be rounded up as replacements. Fed up, Bostonians detained members of the British fleet, including one of Knoll's lieutenants. The Massachusetts governor, William Shirley, was able to persuade Knowles not to retaliate. He helped to facilitate an exchange, the impressed Bostonians, for the British hostages. That January, a young Samuel Adams founded the newspaper The Independent Advertiser, published to defend the rights and liberties of mankind. The paper commended the mob for standing up to impressment. Samuel Adams would go on to become a leader in the American Revolution. Like what you hear? Check out more at laborhistoryin2.com. Thank you for accompanying us here to the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy Blue Moon Spirits Fridays. We always begin weather from around the world along the banks of the Rogue River in the Rogue River Valley of Southern Oregon on the west coast of the continental United States of America, where it is currently 44 degrees Fahrenheit under partly cloudy conditions and uh, winds will be light and variable with expected highs later in the low 60s. And that'll be nearly the same as yesterday. Partly cloudy this evening, then becoming cloudy overnight with lows in the mid-40s. Winds light and variable. And then rain showers in the morning on Saturday will evolve into more steady rain in the afternoon and throughout the weekend. Highs in the mid-50s. Winds out of the south-southeast picking up to 10 to 15 miles per hour. And we're expecting a half an inch tomorrow and about a quarter inch on Sunday. Pollen is still rated as none here in the little village of Rogue River. The air quality index for the Rogue River Valley region is in the good range at 17 parts per million. And that daytime UV index is low at level 2. Barometric pressure is holding steady at 30.04 inches. Visibility is at 6 miles and relative humidity is at 99%. Weather from around the world is brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that a crowd crowdsources from around the world, and that is the weather underground. London is 50 degrees and fair. Paris is 50 degrees and partly cloudy. Rome is 62 and fair with a wind advisory. Bagram is 50 degrees and mostly cloudy. Kiev is 36 and cloudy. Hong Kong is 64 degrees and fair. Tokyo is 56 degrees and partly cloudy. Melbourne, Victoria, Australia is 58 and cloudy. San Francisco, California is 60 degrees and mostly cloudy. Chicago, Illinois is 48 degrees and mostly cloudy. And New York, New York is 61 degrees Fahrenheit and fair with a small craft advisory. And that is weather from around the world brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that a crowd crowdsources from around the world. Stop at me, 
Associated Press brings us this first Amuse Bouche here at the Chef's Table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy Blue Moon Spirits Fridays because we are all Nighthawks in the Diner of Life. Five people, including the founder of the Blackwater security firm, went on trial in Austria yesterday, Thursday, accused of exporting two crop spraying aircraft that were allegedly refitted for military purposes without required permits. The trial in Wiener Neustadt, south of Vienna, stems from an investigation into a local company, Airborne Technologies GmbH, which fits out aircraft with sensors and other equipment. Prosecutors say that two Airs Thrush agricultural aircraft were equipped with armor, extra tanks, and a special camera that could be used for marking and illuminating targets. They say one was sent to Malta in 2014 with Kenya as its declared destination and landed in troubled South Sudan, while the other was sent to Bulgaria in 2015. The defendants are accused of violating Austria's law on war material by exporting such equipment without permission. One of the defendants, an Australian pilot, is accused of flying the two planes across Austria's borders, while the four other defendants participated in the deal. They are Blackwater founder Eric Prince, two managers at Airborne Technologies, and a trained pilot who allegedly was an advisor. All pleaded not guilty as the trial started. Norbert Vess, a lawyer for Prince and two other defendants, argued that the modifications made to the planes did not turn them into war material. We maintain with firm conviction the point of view that the categorization is legally wrong. The Austrian press agency quoted him as saying, he said all the modifications are completely innocuous. You know, extra armor, bigger tanks, cameras that can illuminate potential targets. You know, innocuous. He described what happened as transparent export proceedings and said the first plane was always destined for Kenya, but made a landing in South Sudan due to technical problems. Oliver Fellernig, a lawyer for the two airborne managers and the company, described the prosecutor's accusations as pure fantasy. The next scheduled court session is scheduled for December 14th. Je te donne ce mon amour pour la vie entière La promesse de me trouver à tes genoux Aussitôt que tu m'appelles Rester toujours fidèle C'est tout C'est tout Je te donne tous mes printemps Mes étés de mer Mes automnes, quand les feuilles tombent partout Si ce n'est pas une bonne affaire Je te donne tous mes hivers Even more staff at the Associated Press brings us this final amuse-bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. The lead U.S. development agency plans to restart food aid deliveries for millions of people across Ethiopia in December, five months after it took the extraordinary step of halting its nationwide program over a massive corruption scheme by local officials. U.S. Agency for International Development officials on Wednesday described wide-ranging new reforms in handling of food aid to the East African country to try to prevent a repeat of what they said may have been the largest theft of food aid in history. The anti-theft measures will be tested for one year, USAID spokesperson Jessica Jennings said, adding that they will fundamentally shift Ethiopia's food aid system and help ensure aid reaches those experiencing acute food insecurity. Ethiopia is Africa's second most populous country and one of the largest recipients of U.S. humanitarian aid due to droughts, conflict, and other factors disrupting food supplies.
About one-sixth of Ethiopians received food aid before discovery of the food theft earlier this year. Well, that brings us to the end of our broadcast period for the day and the week. But you do know Netroots Radio broadcasts on, and we will meet up here on Monday for River City Hash Mondays. So do stay tuned to Netroots Radio all day and all night and all weekend for all the breaking news as it breaks. And we will meet up here on Monday, right here in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon appétit. Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des TR, des photos de bord de mer, de mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère, de mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais du frais d'Aster Revoir un latte coère Je voudrais toujours te plaire Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je veux déjeuner par terre Comme au long de golfe clair T'embrasser les yeux ouverts Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver. Dans mon jardin d'hiver.